Liberalism, the entirety of it, and all of its little mini cults, is Luciferian to its core. And I've said that, and for some reason, people seem to have glossed over that as as a very uh, direct shot to the to the face. Uh, you know, other things I've said has has, has drawn much more ire and attention, but I, I feel like that's the one thing that I've said that should. <laughs> should get more attention in some ways, and I think just people don't want to deal with it. There's this, uh, a, a de- there's this desire to be a la carte with al- with liberalism, and unfortunately, you you just can't you, no. you can't just pick your devil. You know, you set up a parallel institution that is capable of both resisting the rewards and the punishments of the regime. So, if you're setting up a parallel political structure and you want it to survive, and if it, at a certain point in time it thrives, it will become a threat to the state, and they will try to crush it with violence. So you have to prepare yourself that at some point, if you have a political consciousness and you are creating that outside of the current structures of the administrative state, or maybe even within them, to game the system for your own Schmidian us versus them, uh, the political, they will eventually find you and stamp you out, you know, the lawfare stuff or with actual violence and, and these types of things. So this is that whole thing of do your right thing. And this is why I've loosely committed myself to the idea philosophically of parallelism. But then there's a whole range of question. Well, what the heck does that mean? Right. So okay, let's, let's, that's a let's big, that's a big problem. You know, I yeah. So I we can set that, that aside. I, yeah. No, no. I, well, no, we're, we're not going to set that aside. We're going to dive right into that. Okay. Because I think I figured it out now. Let's set this table. You've come out against, as you put it, the technological state and Christians' involvement in it. Uh, originally, this conversation was going to be between with you, me, and, and David Gronowski, but David Gronowski is a bit busy with uh, king yes, making and, 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 and stuff. So uh, scheduling became pre- pretty impossible because David has a bit of a, a counter view than, than yours. And I found myself kind of in the middle. So this is getting into stuff that I'm hoping not to get heretical, but this is the very difficult thing. And there is going to be people who are listening to the show and who are fans of this channel. There is going to be multiple conversations going forward, especially in 2025, 2025, specifically about this, because as we are entering this new age, I've defined the age, the spirit of the age as the vengeful son, the counterbalance to the vengeful son, it will be the prodigal son. Vengeful son being a spirit of resentment and total violence. The prodigal son being a spirit of humility to return to the father, to repent and be redeemed. Right. Just to give Mm -hmm. the places in, in, in big blocks here. What I see this as is to cue it back to the title of the show. What would Jesus do in this technological political society that we've been entrapped in, in this liberal frame, which I would define as Luciferian to its core and this is echoed by Dugan and, and a few others, uh, which I have my disagreements with, but overall I think there's a synthesis happening here. If we're going to make a, a dichotomy or a dialectic here, and excuse the term, would be between righteousness and resentfulness. Because what liberalism does, and this is something that Matt Erickson and I have talked quite a bit about, is that liberalism is not just a Gnostic factory, but a resentful factory. It only works when you have something to liberate yourself from. When you define yourself as this, and this is a Girardian observation, that the modern liberal has taken on this victimhood, right? Has said, I am modeling Christ. Christ is the perfect victim. Therefore, I too am a victim. 
And there's something to be said about the man who realizes that he has been born into shackles and is, is looking through a righteous indignation to free himself and a man who is resentful of his shackles and therefore reacts against the system, which in actuality just strengthens the system, as you were saying before. This is the phenomena of Satan chasing out Satan versus seeing Satan fall like lightning. And as I've said more and more clearly, and this is going to be a big narrative function of the show going forward, is that I'm involved in a spiritual war. I have declared war against Satan, and I will see his kingdom come down in my own way, in my own form. Whatever I can do to tear his kingdom down, I will do now in my life. That is my Mm. life's mission. And I believe this is a righteous cause. I'm not resentful to liberalism. I just want to see it end. And with full knowledge that whatever takes its place will most likely be another form of Satan. We Again, we are seeing Satan chasing out Satan. The past election, a lot of people are very excited about things. And I don't want to rain on anyone's parade. At the same time, all I see is an invitation to violence. When we talk about the, let's say, just the immigration crisis, which is a crisis, which is real, which is a problem, which needs to be dealt with, and it will be dealt with, but I'm worried about the ways that it will be dealt with. Because when you look into things like WorldCoin or with things that are being flouted out in the Australian parliament right now, Mm -hmm. and you're seeing, and the conversations that are being had in the British parliament, digital ideas are going to happen. The conversation within the digital ID realm, just to pick one thing, because we're going to get into technology a little bit, is not should we or what if. It is this is going to happen. Now the conversation is only how do we implement it. And when you look at WorldCoin, which is a a Dreesen Horowitz, mostly Horowitz cutout, that's a we're going to scan your eyeball and use your bio data to verify you on this WorldCoin app. Other governments are looking at, you know, some sort of digital ID because of keeping the kids safe, like we're having in Australia. Britain's been throwing their things out. I think there's a war within the elites in terms of narratives, whether it's going to be chips or eye scans or facial recognition or whatever it's going to be. But I'm very, very sure that in the next 5, 10, maybe 15, I'm more citing on five-year time, it will become increasingly impossible for you to access the internet without some sort of bio ID. And then that's going to present a very clear, decisive choice, especially for Christians, because this is the mark of the beast. This has been prophesized. This is like, this is in our wheelhouse now. Okay. So you and I both make Mm -hmm. a career currently. I uh, certainly, I, I, I wasn't intending on this, but now it's my, it's my job to make money on the internet. And you might get to a point where you're going to have to make a real real big choice about whether you're going to use the internet or not. And what's the price to pay for using this marketplace? And I think increasingly it's going to get to the point where your choices are, well, eye scan or chip or, you know, brain implant or give the data that give the government your data, whatever it is. That's com- that's that's coming. And they're going to set it up really brilliantly with multiple points of attack, which is like, well, we have to get these people out, right? These illegals out. Let's, yeah, let's you and I here. have taught, discussed this. Um, yes. And once you yeah, get them out, it. well, how do you keep them out? Well, there's this handy dandy uh, digital ID system. They've yeah. already floated this in Florida during the pandemic when DeSantis, I think he did a limited version of this, where he essentially was having, you know, uh, green cards on some sort of digital platform so that you could, you know, if you're going to hire some Mexican immigrants uh, in the back of a Home Depot, you know, you could live scan their ID. That's coming. That's that's already here, basically. It just hasn't been formalized yet. Well, so this is sort of the, probably on an end point, but it, it's one of those steps on a journey, right? So I guess from people's perspective, in terms of doing what you might say, like in a Lulean analysis or larger cultural analysis, if you kind of dovetail in some of Spengler's ideas, which I think are generally correct about the origin and the rise of the West, sort of beginning around the year 1000 and moving forward. So I have come to see the West as a reaction to Christendom. And I know people will disagree with me and people say, well, no, 
The West could only happen because of Christendom, and that both things are true. In a sense, the secular technological state couldn't arise in India or China or the other places because of the nature of those cultures wouldn't necessarily allow it. It was the West really that made it kind of possible. And the West makes it the target in a sense, as you say, for the enemy, the evil one, the Luciferian nature of it, because the evil one wants to undermine the Christian community and the Christian faith. Around the year 1000, you begin a long, slow process of attacks that undermine the cohesive, you might say, unified Christian society. The introduction of the university system and free inquiry, these types of ideas. You get the new science and the new learning that was emerging in the 1300s. And then you begin to move forward through the Renaissance and um, up through the Enlightenment. And by and large, much of the attack has been trying to liberate society from the authority of the church. This then creates, going forward, this debate, politics downstream from culture or is culture downstream from politics. But I would argue that both culture and politics are downstream from religion, from your belief system. What we're seeing is a parallel belief system to Christianity that's a reaction to Christianity. So it's a kind of an inversion, a deformation, it's an emptying, it takes some of the forms of Christianity, perverts them and subverts them. And the mechanism by which this alternate power expresses itself politically and culturally is in liberalism and the administrative state. And because once you understand the nature of technology in terms of the idea of human progress is really the religion that gets birth to counter the Christian faith is this religion of human progress that we within the bounds of history through human effort and ingenuity through reason, through science, through technology, as it grows up, you begin with humanism and then you move forward from there. You make humanity the center of human history. And so it is up to us to instantiate and to fix the problems that was wrong. So Rousseau then creates the philosophical underpinnings that, you know, we're born basically good. So the problem isn't with us. The problem is then out there in society. And so using technology and science and reason, we are then going to apply ourselves to fixing society. So all of these things are happening all at once. Then you get the growth of the merchant classes, the money class, all of these tools that they're using are very powerful for making money. You end up in the 1700s with a kind of social plasticity. There's a lot of changes, the reformation, you know, the introduction of the printing press leads to the reformation. And then the reformation lays the groundwork for the merchant classes to flex and to cement their power. And within all of this social plasticity, you have an inversion of hierarchy, the flattening of society to democracy. And then you have these democratic institutions and all of it comes together that you have the rise of the, the centralized state that begins to undermine the old feudal order, even before it switches over to, to a, the more democratic, fully merchant class based up. You, know, you think of, of France prior to the revolution, they were already highly centralized states using many of the tools and the abilities of this new managerial class. And then as you move forward and as industrialization begins to undermine society, the old social order that was built around the household, the church and everything is undermined. People move out of the country into the cities to go work in factories. Then you need things to replace the social order. And so replacing that is propaganda. The administrative state now takes along a lot of the functions that the communities used to take on. So caring for the poor, the education, caring for the sick, you know, and that also then undermines the role of women in society. Now, women are, in many cases, they're prosperous. They're looking for a role. They don't have a household. They don't do education. They don't do health care. They don't do caring for the aged, all of these types of things. So they want to move into the worst. And now, like the economy, the Greek word economy, oikonomia, is basically the management of the household. So women move into the economy and they begin to, so all of these things get messed up. But the bulk of it is now you have with this management of society in the administrative state is required in a sense to centralize power, to centralize things, to you know, facilitate economies of scale for making money. And what happens is that the administrative state, and this is, we're talking about the technology of administration as you find it 
it in government, in business, in NGOs, in nonprofits. This means this technology of administrative science or whatever you might call it that way of administrative technique becomes the means by which we fix everything in society. And you see it in churches, you see it in government, you see it in business. These administrative techniques are the core of establishing, in that sense, heaven on earth. It becomes a utopian sense. And you're constantly doing it through scientific improvement. You, 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 know, you, you implement policy, see how it works, come back, have a discussion group, and then update it and, and change the policy and improve them in theory. What happens then is that the state within democracy, within the state, you know, if, if you have democracy, you have to win the votes of people, right? You have to address their problems. And so the, the instrument of the state begins to address every problem that you need to secure votes. And what happens in the end is that the state becomes the singular reality within which we live and move and have our being. There is now in the technological society only one solution. Every solution is a technical solution. So it involves some, either a machine, a device, a program, or a technique, an administrative structure, a policy program. Every solution to every problem has the same fundamental approach, and that is technique. And so now technique becomes the means by which we overcome the problem. So we erase all of the evils in society. All of them will be erased by technique, by technology, through the mechanism of the administrative state. So in a once the state becomes both God and savior operating. And that's why as you sweep away a religious society, all of your meaning, all of your direction is now found in politics. And then propaganda reinforces that, you know, all the mechanisms of news and, and information drive you towards the political. And it creates a society in which everybody is looking only and fully to the political for all of their solutions in life. And so it becomes an omnipotent entity that really can't be challenged. Let me throw this at you. I floated this out recently in conversation with an academic agent. I believe that Congress in the United States and probably Parliament in the, the European context and Canadian context as well, will be replaced by AI, both formally or informally. Because essentially what Congress is, is an analog version of AI. The fundamental issue here, in orthodoxy, in orthodox Christianity, suffering mm -hmm. and sacrifice are key. In fact, we suffer and we choose to suffer, we volunteer to suffer in order to become closer to God. The idea that I'm formulating is that technology at its root form, in a spiritual sense, in its rightful sense, is not about ending suffering, but dealing with time. So technology technically, <laughs> the technique of technology is to free us from time itself. I'll give you a little example. And so let me just riff on this a little bit and I'll, I'll throw it to you. With, with, let's say with AI, right? What, what uh, Lex DeBlanc and my esteemed uh, producer and I are doing with AI. We are able to produce uh, video content, audio content, and, and many different kinds of content seamlessly that would normally have taken us a team of, of five guys, we can do with two on a shoestring budget. And that's amazing. It's a grace because it frees us up time. We could still have done this without AI, but it would just take us an enormous amount of time or we'd have to throw people and money at it in order to reduce that time quotient. So technology, I think in its rightful place, is a time saver. From the plowshare to the AI program, it's really just saving you time. Things you could do by hand, but it's laborious and problematic and all those other things for it, right? So you can do a generation of work within a smaller time frame. And I think this is the real crux of it, where we both differ and are coming at it in the same place. In modernity, Technology, and I'm going to include the technology of both religion and politics in this, is an end to suffering. This is a Sam Harris talking point to go outside of everything decent and normal. But he believes that even meditation is an end of suffering. And that's the problem. There's hmm. the Lucifer. There's Satan. If you're trying to end suffering, well, A, it can't be done. In fact, you're just going to increase it because that's what Lucifer really wants anyways. But even if you could try to reduce suffering, you're only going to increase it. 
and you're and and by also by we're trying to reduce suffering you're taking yourself further from god because god's love and this is this this is the the idea the thought that led me to a spiritual awakening the aha moment of my life what really r radicalized me to go from a 32 years of atheism to a observing true believing orthodox christian literally overnight mm -hmm. was a realization that god's love includes suffering and does not exclude it that suffering is critical to god's suffering so even if we are trying to s cure cancer and even if we are able to cure it let's say 90 percent of cancer is born because of environmental uh, factors because of the food we're eating etc cetera, etc cetera. sure but there will another suffering will take its place because it has to because we have to suffer in order to be brought to God, to be brought to a deeper communion and relationship with God. And if, if we are using technology to reduce or eliminate suffering, we're actually bringing ourselves further from God. We are literally watching, we are literally being part of the process of Satan chasing out Satan rather than Satan falling like lightning. That's the crux. There was that Jordan Peterson tweet today, the life is suffering. So we do suffer, and one of the characteristics of a world that is stained by sin is, and that's uh, you know the Heidelberg Catechism that uses the word misery, right? So that that you know our condition is miserable, but this is not what God intended for us. That's one of the reasons why the story of Genesis is so vital, is that this is not what God intended for us, and nor is it the end of the story. If you read the book of Revelation, you know, now I make all things new, right? And a part of that is there is an end of suffering. And so you think to yourself, well, why, why did suffering happen in the interim? The thesis that I am working with, I think we've typically gone with, it was pride that led us to fall. And I'm, I'm beginning to come to the mind that it was rather than pride, it was impatience. We were made, created good, but that was not the end. God had tasks for us. You know, we were to till the soil and keep, you know, till and keep the garden. We were to name the animals. So there's a whole range of tasks, you know, be fruitful and multiply. So there was this whole range of tasks that God had given to us. And I think there was also something for us that we were to become, that there was intentionality in what God wanted for us. So we had the tree of life you know, everlasting life, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God forbade them. What got me thinking this is, is this is C.S. Lewis, I think, his thesis in Paralandra, that what we, it was our impatience, and this is the temptation, is that, you know, why do you want to wait on God? You know, why did he forbid it? You need to take this now. You know, why would you put this off when you could have this great thing? And so we took the knowledge of good and evil, and that we gained knowledge that we weren't ready for, and it didn't come in God's time, and we weren't willing to wait till we had matured to the point where we were ready for it. Because I, I'm, I think of the mind that the intention of God, and it's hard to know, and this is all very speculative, but you think of what's the life cycle that we've been talking about, the life cycle of the great culture. Energies, right? energies and essences, pal. <laughs> right. So you, you start with the great cultures. They begin in the soil, and they end in civilization, right, in the, in the megacity then they collapse. Well, why? Because these are human endeavors. It's the, it's the redoing of the story of Babel over and over and over again. Right? But if you look at the bookends of scripture itself, it begins in the garden, in the soil. And where does the story, the story end? It ends with the vision of the heavenly city coming down from on high. But who builds this city? It's God's city. And it comes down complete from him. We grasp for something and we continue to grasp for something that God wants us to wait for. The waiting involves, of course, it involves the sacrifice of his own son. The core of Christianity is not so much fighting for what is right. Although in a world of sin and evil, I think there's a theological place for fighting, but the core of it is that we suffer for what is right rather than we fight for what is right. That's, in a sense, the model of, of Christ on the cross. That's about carrying your cross. 
And our process is one of dying and rising. We die to the old self so that way we can reveal what is now hidden in Christ. The old has to be shed. It has to be put to death. And almost like the skin of a snake that has to be shed, that we then take off our old clothes and then the new clothes reveal themselves underneath. Part of that process then is, is carrying your cross, is suffering, but also learning to be patient and waiting on God's time. That's the really hard thing. So we build these grand civilizations over and over and over again. But what we're really waiting for is the city of God. That this is, in a sense, Augustine's great thing. When Rome is collapsing, people are just like, well, w why is this happening? And Augustine said, well, we're not really waiting for Rome. We're waiting for the city of God. And so that's, a sense, sort of my way of coming to it this way, because I think you're right about suffering. Suffering is not an end in and of itself. It's just one of the realities of life. But it's also, in that sense, that that cleansing fire. So it is that carrying your cross, in a sense. So you you suffer for a purpose of cleansing yourself, to glorify God, to bring glory to Christ's name. You know, there's that whole sequence, and I think it is in Peter, where there's this whole series of trials and tribulations that you have to earn, but each trial and tribulation that you do is a step onto the next trial, which is a step onto the next trial, and you have to learn each of these things in sequence. Actually, the interesting thing that you, and then just, just to talk to, before I forget this thought, um, as an aside, this notion of time, this is one of the things that Elul notes about the technological society, is that it continually promises to save us time. We have all of these time-saving techniques and devices. But he says, what do you do with the time that you save? Exactly. And then, well, again, it comes back to Sabbath. Like, what is Sabbath? Sabbath is time set aside for worshiping and connecting with God. That's time, is, time is the medium of the spiritual life. The medium is a message, right? The interesting thing, I don't know if you've checked out some of my work on civilizational capital and my concepts around there, but I basically say that... <laughs> If you look at, let's say, a small fishing village out on the Adriatic who gets really good at fishing and puts all of its efforts into fishing and develops that kind of capital around fishing, so all things connected to it, boat building, net building, et cetera, marketing, et cetera, et cetera, and you keep investing that human capital over in time and eventually you go from a small fishing village to the Portuguese. And I'm very fascinated as to that magical capitalism that happens from the fishing village to the Portuguese. My assertion is that we no longer live in a civilization. We have all the trappings of it, but we no longer live in a functional civilization because we do not produce civilizational capital anymore. And we haven't for a very long time, much longer than just the last 40 years. I'm talking, you know, probably the last 120 or, or even more, depending where you want to place the marker. What we have now, I think, with the Trump presidency, and I don't want to give too much hope and uh, you know powers and principalities kind of talk to to this moment. But what's bigger than the Trump presidency itself is this very small window of opportunity, I believe, to begin to grab the narrative, say that it, this is our narrative now. This is Elon Musk saying we are the media now. This is the same thing. What is the media? The media, the, the media is the narrative. So it's our narrative. What can we do with it? So if we're starting from the starting principle of we no longer live in a civilization and it's on us to build it, then to each his own, how do we build it? And in my viewpoint, we start with building churches because all towns build up around a church. And all civilizations build up around the town. So we, if we start to build, so as they burn down churches, we don't accept that. We don't just bemoan it and point fingers and say, oh, woe is us. We say, fine, challenge accepted. We build them again. And we build them back better, to coin a phrase. We don't just build them back better. We build them in a way that they can't understand. This is showing cell phones to Amazon tribes. We're going to build the good, the beautiful, the true. Mm. We're going to build the foundations for it, for our children to take on and forward, because we will not see the fruition of this. Because our model is, as you said, the city of God. If we're taking every single civilization, I use the example of the old fable of the um, crow trying to drink from the water by dropping little stones in the water to rise a level so he can drink. That's how I see it, that we are a stone in this. We will fail. 
I guarantee you we will fail. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. Because we are laying the groundwork. We are modeling this kingdom of heaven. And as we model the kingdom of heaven and reject the kingdom of Satan, we build past it. We build things that are good, beautiful, and true. And that everyone objectively understands it because it attaches itself to your innate divinity as we are more and more successful in that, whether it be in a technological realm or otherwise, we are modeling for future generations what could be possible. That's our interplay with God. I'm not saying, and I and I'm again, I'm not saying we will build the city of God. I'm saying we will not. I'm saying that we can build something that is at least trying to be that, putting that as a model as something to hope and direct towards. And as far as we get, we get as far as we get. And when they knock it down, okay, well, future generations will have to pick it up and, and rebuild it. And I think that's a calling. It's certainly my calling. I know that yeah. I was brought here to, to build churches and I will build churches and they will be good and beautiful and true. I tend to be, broadly speaking, Spenglerian in a sense that I I think that when you see cultures grow in history, they begin in the soil with a warrior class. Then they, they grow, they mature. And at a certain point in time, the cultural flowering reaches its kind of a zenith. And then there is a transition from the countryside and the country manor, so to speak, and the warrior nobility into the city. And not necessarily the merchants, but the life of the city takes it over. And once this culture is taken up into the life of the city, it's basically a dead thing now. Spengler argues that that moment happens somewhere right around the time of Rembrandt. And that the zenith of Western civilization as a culture, as a generative culture, reached its height in the Netherlands with Rembrandt and the masters that were there, everything that was going on. And Spengler goes through his whole analysis about the colors of the paint and all of this kind of thing. For, the, for our Polish listeners, we can say it's Chopin. It's fine. Just calm down. <laughs> yeah. There we go. And then from there, there's the, the passing of it over. He thought it probably should have gone over to England, but it doesn't. It stays with Napoleon. There's a transition point um, where... No, it gets passed over to England and then the global city thing is sort of the global empire of Britain and then America. And it's basically, I mean, I know people generally tend to think of American dynamism as generating culture, but what Spengler would argue is that basically what you're doing is you're using up the fuel of a culture that was prepared before you between the year 1000 and the year, what, the mid 1600s, 1700s kind of thing when it peaked, right? And then from there, we've just been basically using up that capital, expending it, like putting logs on the fire and just using it up. And then eventually it's done. And we're getting fairly close to that point where it's just done. This raises the question of how our culture is born and how our culture is birth. But Christianity, and this is one of the things even Spengler notes, is that Christianity is, most cultures are born in an attachment to place. And that they're born in a particular people, staying in a particular pace, and then certain conditions happen. And after he's, you know, he figures 10, 20 generations, there is a cultural development and a transition takes place. The, the culture moves from what's called a Falhallen state to a mature culture. The warrior class emerges, and the culture, a great culture, then develops with its own impulse and, and so forth. Now, one of the observations that he makes is that Christianity is different in the sense that it's not tied to a place and that he talks about it as a ghetto culture. And that's one of the reasons why my podcast is called, you know, the Christian ghetto, just sort of taking that and owning it, right? So you're going to use the N word for us, right? You know what I mean? We'll take it and make our own kind of thing. But one of the things is that when you look at like what's happening with Christ, with Jesus, and with the apostles, and with the new church, is that Jesus is intentionally founding a community and giving birth to a new culture. A new covenant relationship between God and his people is being born. Not just a new culture, but a new concept that we still haven't fully dealt with, which is well, the and, Well, yeah. And so how does it instantiate itself and replicate itself? It creates a new hierarchy 
based on the salvation of God. So there's those passages in 1 Corinthians 12 where he talks about the body and all of its constituent parts, Paul does. But you have a very hierarchical arrangement, but it's rearranged not on the world's values, but on the values of God. There's this new hierarchy that comes because of Christ's sacrifice. It reorients our, our relationship with the Father and with the Spirit. So you have this, this relation. But what makes it work is not that you grow up in a particular place and well, you're just born that way. And that's the sort of like what you call the unchosen bonds, right? So what is the replacement for the unchosen bond? Well, the replacement for the unchosen bond is discipleship. And the process of discipleship, which is very hierarchical, you know, the rabbi teacher and the master student type of relationship. And what you see in the gospels is not just a story about who Jesus is and what he's doing, but you also see Jesus in this story teaching his disciples how to do discipleship. He actually teaches them how to have faith. You know, you talk about the feeding of the 5,000. They come to him with a problem, right? He says, well, you feed them, right? The disciples are like, what do you mean you feed them, right? We're coming to you, Jesus, because we don't have any food. Right? So, and Jesus then, you know, exasperated, he goes and he, he well, how many loaves do you have? And, and we know the rest of the story, right? And then you, at various points, you know, there's the healing, like we tried to heal this one, but we couldn't, you know, and Jesus exasperates, says, well, you have little faith. And well, well, why couldn't we heal him? Well, because this one can only be cast out with prayer, right? So what he's doing is he's teaching the disciples these lessons of faith. And, you know, he does things like he sends them out, right? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, right? So he sends them out and he empowers them with the anointing of the spirit. And then the final anointing comes with his ascension in Acts, but the disciples do get it and they move forward. And you can look in history. There is a number of authors who begin to get very critical that things like the, you know, speaking in tongues, the miracles, visions, prophecies are decreasing. And this is a sign that something wrong was in the church. There's all these indications within scripture is that it's supposed to be very, very active with the spirit. But really, you have this relationship between master and student where the essential community is imparted much the same way that growing up in a community and having unchosen bonds. So the thing that replaces unchosen bonds is this discipleship process. Now, if you grow up in the church, you can absorb it. Um, you know, by osmosis, but there still should be an intentionality of the process. And one of the things that happens, you know, throughout history is that we lose this intentionality about the discipleship process. And we just assume that culturally people are going to pick it up. And so there's this, this gradual ebbing of this process of discipleship. So one of the beautiful things is that we have the scriptures, we have the fathers, we have all the teachers throughout history but we have all of the, in a sense, the tools that we need, the pieces that we need, that if we're willing to seek the Lord, we can learn from all of this stuff and we can begin to rebirth the community again, because it's died and raised a number of times throughout its history, but we rebirth it through this process, not necessarily of like a tent meeting type of revivalism. It's not about emotion, but it's rather about, in some sense, the practice, the discipline, the discipleship, the of discipleship, this in a sense of learning what the disciples learned, of taking their cross and following him, of learning faith. But we can do this again if we're willing to. Now, once you build a community like this, and this is maybe the thing that we can talk about next time, is that this then has political implications. Jesus had political implications and this new covenant community has political implications that many in our community are unwilling to grapple with. And we can talk about why that is like maybe next time. Let's <laughs> give us yeah, let's, let's say <laughs> there's your teaser trailer folks. We didn't even get into violence as oh. a form of, of radical honesty. And, yeah. and, and, and oh, yeah, Alul that, calls Alul says that sometimes violence is prophetic because it's the only thing that can break through to make people see what God is trying to tell them. You know, just you can this let is, people think is, about that this, one a little bit. This is a Girardian nugget, you know, where the yeah, violence right. in the sacred is is talking about how all cultures are born from a murder. I was calling up until the failed assassination attempt of Donald Trump. I was saying, well, there's going to be a murder. This is a, a huge crux of my vengeful son thesis is that we are in this age of the vengeful son where we're entering an age of total violence. 
and that violence yeah. will not be kinetic. It will be it'll be a totalizing violence. It'll be a violence. It, will it consume us? It will consume us. Yeah. And the only antidote to it is the prodigal son. That story of of Perfect. leaving the father in both pride and haughtiness, saying, mm -hmm. I will strike out on my own. And then things have gotten so bad that you're eating the food of the pigs. And you're like, yeah. well, I'm going to return to the father because at least he, he treats his workers better. And to be enveloped by the father, to be to be forgiven, to be redeemed out of a sense of both humility and, and the, that eradication of pride, which I think is the real true litmus test of righteousness, that righteousness cannot be born out of pride. It cannot be what we want because what we want is the Caesar. But what we often get but is the disciples the ask over carpenter. and over again, when will you claim your kid? When, when will you restore Israel? When are you going to ride in on the on the horse as as the vengeful knight and sweep the right. Romans away? Right? That, that's what and the disciples wanted. And instead of that, you get the the element that over three hundred years transforms the Roman Empire into the Byzantium Empire, into the yeah. Holy Roman Empire, and that transforms the Roman Empire into Christendom and spreads Christendom yeah. throughout the West. Oops. Yeah. Through conversion, that's what that's what Spengler says. They conquer through conversion. Now, that doesn't always happen the way that people think it does, but that's another thing we can. But it's not about. just it's just as conversion in the standard sense of, of showing up your door and saying, "Have you have you heard about our Lord Jesus Christ?" It's conversion through the truth. It's a truth that permeates your daily existence. That once you have to start to contend with it, you can't contend with anything else. The Trinity is is such a paramount thing to get right. When I was reading Father Sarah from Rose's book, uh, The Orthodox Survival Guide, and I don't remember the exact passage, but it really hit me. Up until that point, I had gone through my conversion, and I had, uh, for some whatever reason, been very porous to energies and essences and, and the Trinity. I'm, I'm not saying that I understand it uh, on a theological perfected form, but... But I just I had no resistance to it. I just was like, all right, give it to me. Yeah, fine, good, right? Uh, begotten son, sure. I right, got it. I didn't question it. And to me, when I heard people getting into these dialectics and these arguments and these conflicts over it, I I didn't understand. I'm like, look, it's just a theological thing. Like either you get it or you don't. And then I read Father Sir from Rose's book, and I'm like, oh wait, now I get it. Mm -hmm. If you get this wrong, you get it all wrong because what was presented to you the real new covenant is not just the sermon on the mount it is the trinity and once you understand the trinity not only do you understand science and technology and modernity in general but you understand the functionality of reality that we can deal with in this time and frame your father i'm a father we understand that when you're raising a young child, you know the ultimate truth. My daughter's four years old. So there's there's ways you talk to a four-year-old. There's ways you talk to an eight-year-old. There's ways you talk to a 16-year-old. There's things that you reveal to them, not because they're stupid or you want to withhold things, but it's just like, look, you got to skill up. You won't be able to understand this within context. If I drop this on you right now, fine you'll just deal you're, you're probably not going to deal with it well but if i start to reveal this thing to you in all ways slowly over time then suddenly you understand things on a layered level and i think that's that's what the trinity is to us across time we revealed it two thousand years ago we're still struggling with it now mm. and i think that we're entering an age where the Trinity will become much more of a focal point. And this is, uh, I think, key to Cyprian's dimage, a key to understanding energies and essences, and understanding uh, uh, why people are being attracted to, unfortunately, what I, I, I would consider a, a mush Christianity. But within that is still this opportunity to forward the city of God yeah. and what we can build from it. Yeah. These are conversations for the next time. Uh, Kryptos, I love you, man. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, yeah, I just I love having these conversations with you, Jason. It's, I, I, it's, I cannot express to you probably how deeply I respect you, and you. Um, how I look forward to these. We will resume our month. I hopefully will resume a monthly talk every month. Yeah, we will. Oh, and one one last thought, a humorous note on um, 
the Girardian sacrifice um, based on the, the conversation we had just before the election is that the sacrifice that was necessary to bring Trump into office and usher in the new era was, of course, peanut the squirrel. Right? No, I thought the exact same thing. <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, I knew there was going to be a murder. I did not expect it to be a squirrel. But you know what? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Cryptos, let the people know. Let the people know right, where they can they get can you. Find. So my my Substack is seekingthehiddenthing.com, seekingthehiddenthing.com, and always on Twitter, at underscore cryptos and um, um, enjoy the threads and the content. And um, yeah, I'm, right now I'm in the middle of a series on um, propaganda, Jack O'Leary's propaganda. So we're deep, we're doing deep, deep dives. Probably the biggest series that I've done, only because I think um, the the topic of propaganda is just so vital for people to understand. So that's what I'm working on right now. I think I'm four um, four pieces in, and probably another four or five before it's all done. Always don't. Never be afraid of challenging your priors, folks. That's uh, that is yeah. one of the keystones of this channel. If you're listening to this, of course, uh, I recommend to you to, uh, if not through this channel, through other through other means, shake shake your trees, and yep. and question why you think you know what you think you know. And yeah. I appreciate and each and every one of you. Yeah, and I man, uh, thank you, man. Uh, Cryptos, I, I I like I said, I. Uh, I deeply respect and appreciate you. Thank you. And I appreciate your, that. Thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. We'll talk to you again very, 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 very soon. Oh, and I'm uh, I'm Jason Marinchuk. Marinchuk now. It's later than you think.